Hey, it's your boy Local FC, and we are here with the Western Sydney Wanderers. We're doing pre-season vibes. We're talking culture, DNA, and heritage of this amazing club. We've got the main man in the building. First big question, gaffer, mister, robo, or Carl? I get called a number of things. Uh, not those other names, but... Probably uh, Robbo is what I like people to call me. Yeah. Gaffer is what players call me. Fair call, fair call. Um, firstly, for me, personally, for you, um, with your family and your pandemic, away from football, how has that been for you the past sort of year and a half? Everyone's obviously had a tough time, but how has it been, you know, being in a foreign country and, and your family, how is everyone dealing with it personally? Yeah, listen... I'm not going to lie, it's been difficult, you know, being without my daughter. My wife has struggled a little bit with her being in Vancouver, not being able to travel, not being able to be here with us. She's 19 years of age, so she's a young lady and able to, wanted to live on her own, able to live on her own. So we have to give her a little bit of freedom, but not being able to see her has been very difficult. Uh, exactly the same as everyone else that's been dealing with this pandemic. So that's why I say it's always important that you check in with people in general, um, whoever you know, because everyone's dealing with the same situations. And then people don't, I think, you know, I call it the Superman theory with footballers, like you, you put your Superman suit on, you put your, which is your jersey, you get on the pitch and you've got no disagreements with your partner, your, your kids are healthy, like people don't think these things affect you guys for some reason, like how's it been, like how yeah, do you deal with that kind of stuff? It, it, it's strange because people assume that you are this, like, you are this superhero who can deal with everything. You. We're just human beings at the end of the day, and we go through the same emotions. The players go through the same emotions as, as a postman, as a as a chef, as a as a as a pilot, and it's understanding them. And one of my main roles as a manager is is to get to know the person because if I get to know the person, get to know their background, understand what they like, dislike, what they need. You man manage people differently because you understand the different backgrounds, different cultures. Um, they're dealing with different things at different times, but the one thing I do guarantee them all is that they will need my help at certain stages throughout their career. So I keep uh, an open dialogue with them um, and I ask them to be honest. And most of the boys are really honest. Some of them don't like telling me things because they think it will hinder them. But I keep reassuring them that you know anything that I do off the field is either to help them, advice, um, if they need my support or someone's support, I'm always there. You know, and then when we cross that white line then it's when I do my talking and I get my work across to them and then it's a different mindset. And have you had to adjust, like obviously with off season and things like that, checking in with like make, hey, making sure you check in or just change your managerial yeah, style? Yeah, I anyway? have. I generally do it anyway, um, whether it's throughout the season, um, but especially throughout the, the pre-season, the extended pre-season, there, there was different situations with players. They were stuck in lockdown, unable to train. There were players that were dealing with lockdown dealing with um, family COVID issues within the family. Um, so I tried to, if I wasn't able to speak to them, so a member of staff was able to speak to them. So we make sure we covered all the boys because, you know, at times like this, it's important. I'm not their manager, I'm their friend and I'm there to support them. So it was mainly a, a checking in period for them. Um, and when we got back to work, then obviously it's, I become the manager again. And these days, modern management, how much is football? How much is people management? Yeah, I get asked this quite a lot. And what I say, the, the general rule of thumb that I work to is probably 70% is social competence and 30% is tactics. Everyone just thinks you're a, you're a wonderful tactician uh, and that lot, but it's about managing, especially when you have big characters and big egos in the locker room. Um, everyone needs to be managed differently. So the management side of it is totally different. That's why you have your coaches. That's why I've got a great support staff is because their job is to coach and they can be their friend. The manager's job is to manage people. And if you do that correctly and you delegate, uh, then you're all going in the right direction. So JD Sports, sponsors of the club have hooked you up with a pair of Addy Hamburgs. I've got the Gary Asden Adidas Specialis. Um, take us back to you growing up, you know, casual terrace culture in the UK. It, it has its highs it has its lows but you know the, the casuals fan, any of the younger fans that don't know is when the fans used to go on away days into Europe they used to come back with Lacoste and Sergio <laughs> Tacchini Tacchini and, and they're at us things that they couldn't get in the UK but what are your first memories of you know being in the terraces and, and those kind of things sky blue gazelles is my first uh, probably not a colour you want to wear these days memory no we don't like blue these <laughs> days we like red obviously um, but no just Growing up, we didn't, from where I was from, it's, it's brilliant. Landrin Dodwell is a small town in, in Powys in Wales and people say nothing comes out of there. 
and they're right. Nothing does, unfortunately, except good, honest, hardworking people. And the times when I got to actually go and visit football matches, Cardiff, Swansea, Wolverhampton, you know, I got to travel to the Midlands a few times. You, you really got your eyes open to see the culture, to see the, the trainers. I was a, a, a become a favorite of trying to get trainers different to what everyone else had. Uh, whether that was Sergio Tacchini, whether it was Champion, whether it was the Adidas Gazelles, the Classics, Reebok, you know, all these things. And I just learned that if you put the hard work in, you're able to reward yourself with special things. That's what, you know, that's what the first memory I had. It was a case of blue Adidas Gazelles, which were proper old school. And I still have them to this day, my first pair of trainers that I, that I got many, many years ago. Will we see a pair of these on the pitch this year? Yeah, maybe. I go through, you know, I go through certain times. My first job, first job, first ever job, first mindset was to be a smart suit manager. You know, I did, and I was you know, uh, whistled up, and I was well, in I, waistcoat I, I, and all that lot. I've done today. I've got my manager etiquette just for yeah. you because just you know, and, uh, yourself. and as you get a little bit older, and what happens is you sweat, and your arms are swelling as a manager, and you're you're very emotional and. And then you learn, okay, well, and if you lose a game, you change your mind. You become a tracksuit manager. And then you, so what I've learned is I've become a, a very casual, casual manager in relation, very smart. I'm not going to wear scruffs on the sideline. Don't do that. But definitely retro stuff is something I've worn trainers a couple of times. And I think they are, they are the way forward. But people follow trends. And if someone sees Pep Guardiola wearing a pair of trainers, I'm sure that there's a lot of managers out there that wear trainers. Well, you've jumped ahead into one of my questions, which is something that's very important to me. It's football manager etiquette. Um, I think I can safely say in this country, you're kind of, you're right up there. How important is that to you, to, as you were talking about before, to portray a certain message? Like if you come out looking like you've just gotten out of bed, like yeah. what does that portray to your players and what you're, you're thinking about as a profession? Yeah, you know, what I, what I ask for the players is set high standards. I want them to perform at the highest levels whenever they step on the training field, whether it's training or match matches. And what I say, if you, if you look smart, you feel smart and you feel good, um, I try and set the standard myself. You know, if, if I'm lazy, get out of bed type style, then I think it allows them to look a little bit scruffy on the pitch. And I don't want that, you know, it's, it's an honor to wear this jersey and the players understand that. It should mean everything to you and they understand that. Um, but you can look the part and you do look the part and there's nothing better than a team that looks the part, very smart, very cultured and wins. And that's obviously the biggest objective. That takes me on to my next question. This is a big club, massive club, big jerseys. Uh, B.I. just spoke to us about you know the home and away, the, the historic, uh, iconic vibes that are in those. But can you run us through the, the brand new third kit that no one's yet seen? Yeah, it's a right old snazzy kit, this, isn't it? Obviously, it's got the light. Uh, it's got the silicon badge. Obviously, the great star, which we want another, of course. Obviously, 10-year anniversary on the back. So... Excellent design. Obviously, it's very trendy as well. I think, you know, you go through certain moments in, in, in your life as a player and, and kits get remembered. This is certainly one that will get remembered. And just run the, the fans through, through, through the stripes or the lines coming through the jersey and what they mean to you, you guys at this club. But it means a lot because it's, it's from the academy all the way to the first team, you know, and, and we have to be a club and we are a club that values our academy setup. We value the, the development that we, you know, there's no point putting foundations in place if you're not going to actually use them. You know, we are a club that values that. What we need to do is make sure the pathways are open and, and that means everyone aligned on the same page because you can have so many talented youngsters in your academy but they never get the opportunity to play. My job is to try and give these talented youngsters the opportunity to play but also on the other side I need to win because when you're a club that this size the, the expectancy levels, the demand, the desire to win is at the highest and, and that's what you want as a manager as well. So it's just aligning, it's making sure everyone's on the same page. It's not about one individual, it's about the team uh, and that doesn't just include the players or any player within the football club, it means the staff as well because we all need to be rowing in the same direction. Um, we'll touch upon the, the culture and the DNA of the club but um, coming into a club, how do you implement your own philosophy, your own culture into what their non-negotiables are. Yeah, that's, that's the, I think that's the key component for any manager when they step in the door on day one. It's, it's finding out what the, 
if you want to say the vibe of the dressing room is, it's understanding the characters, it's understanding what, what you, th you think you like, what works, what doesn't work, but it's also, if you do a total change around and you try and invent the wheel on day one, uh, it's not going to end well. So you have to sort of drip feed it, you have to make statements, you have to have a plan in place. And literally the first month, two months on the job is literally a case of, scanning, analyzing, reviewing, uh, and getting in your mind what you want for the first stage of that plan to happen. And, and that's what I did nearly 12 months ago. When I come in, I said that I would identify your talented young players from within our academy. I would try and push them through. I would unblock pathways. But my job was to win games of football as well. And yes, we won games of football. We didn't win enough games of football because we, our target, which was obviously is finals football every year, we were unable to reach. Yes, there were positives, but there were also things that needed to be tidied up and, and we didn't reach. So uh, we have to own that. And I will own that. I've said to the players, we'll own that. Um, but it's how you learn. Football's about learning as well. You, you came into the job last year. Did you realize the, the term big club gets thrown around a lot yeah, around yeah. the world? but this is a big club. Did you realize how big it was before you came in? No, I didn't. Um, I'd heard a lot about it and all the people in the know-how here had, had all said to me how big the football club was. You know, I've been fortunate enough throughout my career to, to play at some wonderful clubs and manage wonderful clubs. And, you know, coming here was a challenge. I wanted to embrace the challenge and get my teeth stuck into it, but I also knew what I wanted. I'm very clear with what I want to do at this football club. Uh, sometimes things don't happen overnight, which is the unfortunate thing because people in general in life want instant success. That doesn't happen, very rarely happens. What you need to do is make sure that the day you walk in to the day you walk out, the football club is about is in a better place than when you arrived. And if you have a plan and you have a, a structure in place and you're clear with what you want, it's not about you. It's about the football club because one thing, players come and go, managers come and go, people come and go. But the one thing that is a constant and remains is the football club and the supporters. How do you, as you said, you're in a results business. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what it is. But how do you have, as a manager, short, medium and long-term goals? How do, you, how do you juggle that? Well, that's the thing that keeps me up at night and that's the thing that makes me turn grey. Yeah. Because you can, you can spin it any way you want. And when I say that, what I mean is you can portray this youth element factor and we have a big, you know, we've got a fantastic uh, owner, chairman, you know, staff here that want to invest and are investing heavily on our, the youth development because there is so many talented young Australians here that I believe can go and play at the next level without a doubt. And we need to make sure that we are the club that takes these players, especially in our region, uh, and develops them and then gives them the opportunity. But I'm also not naive enough to think, you know, you can lose every single game and play all the kids. That's not going to work. That's not going to happen. Supporters don't want that. They want to win. They want to win championships. If you win, then you be, the hardest thing then becomes winning again. And it's important then that you try and figure out solutions to try and do a little bit of both because you can be a winning team and have no youngsters in your setup, which eventually catches up on you because the talented youngsters will leave because they're not given that opportunity. And that's why I say it's not even a, yes, there's a short-term plan to try and come in and get a reaction and try and get to playoffs and, and finals football without a doubt, but trying to win, win the A-League, we know that. But there's also a, a medium and long-term plan. And yes, the manager has to find out a short, find a short-term plan to get results, because if you don't get results, you're not in a job. But I, I also won't go away from my medium and long-term plan. And, and the day that I leave, you know, I'll have a smile on my face, but the medium and long term plans will still be in place. And the next person is up to carry that uh, plan forward and, and obviously try and get the short term results in that period. So uh, you got to enjoy it, you got to embrace it. Um, but the one thing I'll say, you got to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, then you're ad hoc and that's not very good. Um, you, you talk about that combination of, of young and getting that mix right, which is, that, that's football. But also how important is it having young guys or local guys playing in this team who know what it means to put on that jersey, who know the history, who know the tradition. Yeah, it's vitally important. Listen, there's no secret, there's no hiding place that I love young players. You know, wherever I've been, I've always given, given young players the chance. And, and you, sometimes it's not the young players which everyone wants you to give a chance to. It's the ones that actually I feel when I get to work with them, find out what their values are, what their, their, uh, you know, their understanding of the game is like. Uh, and someone who's got a little bit in them that 
has had a little bit of adversity and had to come through it and has survived, has dealt with it, because they're the ones you can tap into their minds. So, you know, I think that's why the young players love being at this football club, because they now know that there's an opportunity for them to play if they do things right. Identifying local talent was the biggest factor for me in, in the off season. You know, was, I made no secret of it. You know, I'm a foreign manager living in Australia and I've needed to get to know this place as well, get to know Western Sydney. It took me a little bit of time, but you know, the fundamental values of people here are a hard work, spirit, fight, desire, never backing down, which is my values in, in the small town in Wales that I'm from. So it fits into my mantra. Uh, what I needed to do is get players to understand because you can sign as many players as you want if they don't understand what the DNA or the fabric of the football club is. When you, chips are down and you need them to roll their sleeves up and really what it means to this football club, they won't know. They'll look at you as if you got probably two or three different heads. So I try to do that this, this off season. I managed, managed to do that this off season, bringing in a certain number of players that had the values of what Western Sydney is about. And I can already see it in training. There is a togetherness. There is a togetherness about these players. They enjoy being around each other. A lot of them have played together for local teams, um, not just in the A-League, but you know in the MPL and, and growing up. And that was important because you're only as good as you, your teammate next year. There's no I in team. Uh, and I know everyone says that and throws it out and it's an analogy, but individuals do win things, but they win individual awards. Teams are the ones that win things. And, and we can't be, in, there can't be any I in my team and there won't be. You know, the, the, the bigger picture for me is the collective always wins. And if, you ever, if I ever wander away from that, then I won't be successful. You talk about vibes in the team. Can you, can you see that? Can you see that in training? There's just a different kind of, this is just something happening? I can, yeah. Whenever you sign new players anyway, there's a freshness because competition brings out the best in people. You know, they might not like it because their place is at, at a little bit of threat. But it makes you better. But it makes you better. And in any walk of life, in any business, in any job that you have, if you bring in someone, it's not a case of someone's coming in to take my job. If you look at it like that, you'll be scared and fearful, and then you'll step back and go away from what you want to do. You have to embrace the challenge, and you learn from it and say, do you know what? If a, if a, if a so-called bigger player, better player comes in, I'm going to make sure that I keep him at the team because there's two ways it goes. You either sulk and you don't play, or you embrace it, you enjoy it, and you push and get in the team, or you push your teammate to be better. And then we all progress. And, and that's the spirit that has been instilled, especially this year, because I think we've got different types of characters this year. I think we've got different types of values in people this year. We've also got the elements and the, and the DNA of people who understand what Western Sydney is about, which is what you need. Because when you pull on this jersey, you know, you, you have to understand what it means. And it means so much to these supporters. Yeah, and we spoke to, well, I spoke to Bernie earlier, and that's, you know, I grew up in the Inner West. I played yeah. for Marconi. I played for Sydney United, the biggest clubs in the old NSL for me. Um, but we said that to maybe let you know, like playing, we, I felt playing in Western Sydney meant that if I could make it here, I can, I can fuck with anyone in the country. Like no one can, and, but I, there's also a chip on my shoulder that you can't get messed with if you're from Western yeah. Sydney. Although, do you see that in the young guys that have grown up and how, how important is it to have that so then the fans then connect go hey these are these are our guys i see that i see that in the value of people in western sydney first of all it's a, it's a never back down mentality you know and there has to be there has to be how can i say this it's a great trait to have obviously you've got to be sensible with it all right and the the, the togetherness of it is brilliant uh, and it's where i'm from in wales get told can't do this can't do that shouldn't do this shouldn't do that and we're like, I'll show you. It's us against the world mentality. And I see that in people here because it is like that. Then you step across the white line and it's 11 against 11. So it doesn't matter about big names. It doesn't matter about who you are. It doesn't matter about how many games you played. That's the, that's the, the mentality, the spirit that these young boys have got. Nothing's given for free in life. And I say this to my son all the time and because he's a smart ass, he'll throw at me, you get tasters in Starbucks that are free. So in theory, he is correct, but he's not correct because in life in general, you have to work and you have to earn what, what you get. And that is what Western Sydney is all about, the inner West. The fans as well, there's a very high football IQ in yeah. this area. It's, it's the don't, don't fuck with me attitude, it's the chip on the shoulder, but the football IQ for me is the birthplace of football yeah. in this country. This is where it all starts. Um, you haven't 
I don't think yet experienced the full Wanderers rocking stadium. You know, I've been here since day one with these guys and walking to the ground. And um, how excited are you to have that? And how do you get that back? Yeah. Well, that's a million dollar question because no, I haven't experienced it to the level that you you have. Uh, but I want to, and I, and I need to. And everyone tells me about it. I've sampled it. You know, when we played Sydney at home. You know, there was a special feel about the place. In all our home games, there is a feel about the place. But, you know, that is with a three-quarter full stadium. I want a full stadium, you know. So how do we go about that? Well, listen, it's important we engage in the community. We know that. It's important we reintegrate with the fans. It's important we get back to what our values are about. And I say our values, now I'm involved. Um, what, what it means to the football club, what it means to the supporters, what it means to every single business around the place. We want them in our building. Then we have to go on to my part, which is I want to play a certain way. I want to play an, an attractive style of football, but I also got to play a brand of football that wins because no one wants to see a team that doesn't win. And we know that it's modern day football. No one likes a loser. We're not here to build losers. We're here to build winners. But also I won't go away. You can play rubbish football and win. Well, that only gets papered over for so long because eventually when you do lose, people don't like the brand of football. So I'm trying to create an identity, a philosophy at this football club, which is instilled from academy all the way up to the first team, that this is the way we're playing. This is how we're playing. These are the values. These are the fundamentals. These are the non-negotiables. And within that, then our exciting football comes out and results come out. And when we get a match of both, then we know where we're aiming, aiming for. And our target is no different to any other team. We want to win. Our expectation is to win. And then when you do win, everyone wants to shoot you down again. So you have to go that extra yard again. But the DNA of Western Sydney is us against the world anyway. So, so we're okay. Like, I was going to say, if people like that here, if you want to shoot us down, just, just try it. Fine. We'll take the first Go shot. ahead, yeah. And we'll stand up and we'll take it. Yeah. Um, from a football perspective, I always feel when a manager comes in, everything's about results. But for me, a first season is, it's a, it's a free throw for yeah. a manager. Um, obviously you wanted to make the finals last year and, and you, you, sh probably, you should have made yeah. the finals but for me second season is now your squad into the third where it's completely yeah. on you how do you how do you make that transition and how is that looking well I think the expectations rise a little bit I think the people talk about pressure and, and what I say with pressure is listen every person in their life deals with pressure but they deal with it in different ways and, and they have it in different ways pressure is not having a job pressure is not being able to see relatives people Pressure is you know, uh, not knowing where your next paycheck's coming from. We, what we get to do is we get to do the thing that we love, the thing that's ingrained in us, and, and, the, and they, the boys get paid for it. So it should never become a chore. It is a privilege to play, especially at this club. You know, we speak about the values and the, the, the things that Western Sydney is all about. And I, what I've done this year is I've tried to make them realise to be a special team, to be a special club, at times, you know, things don't come around too often. But when they do come around, it's special. And I think people remember when we won the Champions League. It's special. Maybe not the best team wins, but the team gets through with team spirit, gets through with the togetherness. So it's trying to get all those things together with also the young players, with also the club, because we are one club, with the supporters to get into the stadium again. They'll only come and watch exciting football. So we need to excite them with our football. We need to win because they'll come and watch winning exciting football. And then when we do that, we're there to be shot down and we've got to use our values to then say, no problem, come and meet us head on. But there's so many things and variables that go into managing, playing, building a club, because I said the club is there. It's been 10 years now in existence and we need to get back to where, we, where everyone wants us because there's nothing worse than a club not being followed by supporters. We want our club to be the best club. We know it's the, got the best facilities. We know it's got the best people. Now we need to get the best team. That's my job. That's my, young, uh, my coaching staff's job. We need to develop the best players. If you're afraid of that, don't be a football manager because if you're scared at any time, you're in the wrong job because it's a privilege to manage this club, it's a privilege to play for this club, and it's a privilege to sport this football club. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing I realized, I always took my football very seriously then, and that's how you, that's how you make yeah. it. But I think when you get to a certain stage, you don't get many shots at the big darts. No. And I think that players, and managers like yourself that have played at the highest level know that. And how, how hard is that? I think, like, you know, speaking to Bernie, he gets that. 
It's like, yeah. oh, I want to win, I want to take these guys with you. But how do you get that into the young guys? Hey, you'll be 25, 26 before you know yeah. it. Well, I think the biggest thing, and what I try and explain to young players is, again, Bernie mentioned about dealing with adversity and Bernie went through an injury, Bernie went through traveling to Europe and, and Asia all over these places to try and figure out where he wanted to go and what he wanted to do. It evolves you as a person. You know, I was told at 15 I wasn't good enough. I was told I wasn't going to play. I was too small, too quiet, too skinny. So I've got two ways of going out. I either deal with it and I accept it and I give in and I go back to Landrin Dodwells where I'm from or I embrace it and I try and prove people wrong. And literally I did prove people wrong and a year later I signed a professional form and the guy who told me I wasn't good enough said a year later I knew I would get that response out of you. So one person's view doesn't mean that you're a good or bad player. What it does, it means it's trying to test out your mentality because mental toughness is the hardest thing in football. And you have to go through adversity. And if you go through adversity, it makes you stronger, not just in sport, in life. Because if you think you're going to sail through your life where everyone tells you how good you are, what you're, you know, what you're good at, what you can do, and not deal with these problems on the field as well as off the field, you're f totally mistaken because life is about evolving, life's about learning, life's about growing up, life's about supporting people. Oh yeah, um, we, we spoke about it off, off camera before, but how do you break down player management, football management, and you know, style over substance? Is it you know, scoring four goals, playing beautiful, breathtaking football, or is it you know, sometimes parking a bus and, and hitting on the counter once? Yeah, again, styles evolve. Sometimes it's dictated by the players you have. Like, I'll use last year as an example. Last year as an example, I thought we, uh, our squad was unbalanced. We had too many attacking players, too many attacking senior players that weren't playing. That suddenly becomes a slight issue based upon older players want to play, the expectancy of them to play. Uh, younger players just love being around the place and want to show the opportunity, whether it's for five minutes, 10 minutes at the end. Um, we scored a lot of goals last year. I still generally believe that we missed so many chances and we were not clinical enough in the final third. And chances... Okay. Yeah, sorry, I thought one thing that I you know, saw a presentation, yeah. like most goals the club's ever scored. Like, yeah. I didn't know that. Second no. most in the league. Like that, that puts you in... That should put you in game. Well, it should. And it did. Yeah. All right. But what it did was... If you look at the statistical data, we missed so many guilt edge chances. Add that to the goals that we did score, suddenly we're in a much better position than what we're at. You know, we're not trying to scrape into the playoffs, we're firmly in the playoffs. Marring with that, that we went through the first eight, ten games of the season where we were very, very solid defensively. Yes, we weren't consistent because people got injured, there was a little bit of suspensions, rotations, things like that. But then we ended up conceding a lot of set-piece goals and that became a, a big flaw in our game. That wasn't down to take out the three games where we conceded seven set pieces, add in six penalties, which are referees' decisions. Three of them were VAR, which were overturned and given against us. One was a deflected free kick. Take out those three games and then the corners where we conceded three off corners in one game, two off corners in another game. We're not even having this conversation. We're talking about were we good enough last year to win it? De generally, deep down, did I believe we were good enough to win it? Yes. Maybe that was my head ruling my heart. This year, I didn't want to leave no stone unturned. So I brought in players that I know were as good as you can get, guaranteed goal scorers, guaranteed chance creators, guaranteed in the A-League, had experience of playing in the A-League, good values, good people, good professionals, and then mire them in with the talented youngsters that we have. Yeah, I mean, I was at every game last year, and you're right, like the set piece was like, oh, not another set piece. Like, but, you know, watching every game, I felt and we spoke about it off camera before, barring the City one, and then you said yeah. well, we were still kind of in that. Yeah. I felt that was the only game where you kind of weren't at the races. Yeah. Um, but I also, you know, I was, I, I'd speak to B, and I was like, if you guys get in the finals, yeah. you were the last team that anyone wants in that finals last year. I think there was a lot of teams that were very, very happy we missed out on finals. Uh, we can't blame anyone else. You know, it was down to us. We weren't good enough because we didn't get enough points. Did we throw it away? Yes, we did at certain times. Was it one particular game? No, it wasn't. Four times last year, we played at home. We were in total command of the games with the way we want to play, with our identity. And on the first chance that the opposition had, they scored. Brisbane was one, Central Coast was one, Adelaide was one. The first shot they have on target, they score. Yet we have four, five, six chances before that. Those are the moments in games which define games. You know, teams that score the first goal usually 
percentage-wise win games of football. We just gave ourselves too many mountains to climb. You know, re after reviewing that last year at the end of the season, which I did every game, every player that played every game, I decided that I needed to change things. You know, bringing in additional defenders, bringing in players with different type of leadership qualities was a fundamental that I wanted, and, and I found them. Obviously, it helps when you have the, the, the players that are from the local region that understand the values, but have also won. Yes, they won at different clubs as well, but they want to win at their football club. This is their football club, you know, and what we need to do is make sure that we're all on the same page with that. You speak about leadership, something you said last year and went everywhere. It did, um, yeah, it was great. <laughs> I think it got the desired result. And, you know, you know, speaking to Bernie, that's something that he's really taken on. And he says he's trying in pre-season to be a lot more of a leader. You brought in Reese, who for me is a Rolls Royce of a defender yeah. um, and a gentleman, a Dharma. Um, Hamid, like, tell me what these guys bring bring to the table for the Wanderers this year. Well, you just you mentioned there Bernie and Tom Hamid. You mentioned you know Dimi Petras. We brought in, we brought in Terry Antonis. We brought Adama Reese. You know, the captain material. Last year, and it, it become a brilliant story. Robbo had said something that we lacked leadership or we lacked people stepping up. Sure. Anything I say publicly, I've told the players. You know, people who work with me, people who know me, they'll find out that, you know, people aren't inside my locker room. So I'm not going to actually say something publicly and then not be proud enough or, or man enough to show my face in the locker room saying it in the public. I don't do that. So what I said was exactly what I said to the players. We need our leaders to step up. And then when we'd lost a game of football, I said I didn't think we had enough leaders to step up. Not when things are going well, when things are going well. And... We got 20,000, 28,000 if we can get to it this year. Support us, patting us on the back and singing our name. That's great. Everyone wants to be a hero then. It's when you're losing, you're under the cosh, you're, you're defending for your lives. It's a little bit of adversity when things don't go your way in a game. That's where I want leaders to step up. And that's what I didn't think we had. When things were going great, yes. It's a, it's a, a sign of character. You know, I, I actually find out more about my players when we don't win than when we do win. Because when we win, it's easy, it's them. When we lose, it's on me and it's on us. And the ones that are able to step up and go, yes, boss, this is what, I wasn't good enough. You know, they'll be in the trenches with me all day long. And have you seen those changes this year? Now I have, listen, it's easy to, easy to see it. Yeah. Um, we'll, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, we'll find out about it. But building locker rooms, creating cultures, creating environments is, it's not, it has to be organic. And you, you can't just suddenly turn up at a football club one day and go, this is what I want, because it doesn't happen. People don't like change, unfortunately. So what you have to do is you have to drip feed them. You have to try and create this energy, synergy between them. You have to explain to them the reasons why we're doing it, because some won't want to change what they're used to. People don't like change, but when they understand it's for the changes for better, all right, and people do, you know, sometimes, um, but we're also focusing on, we're trying to change, we're trying to create, we're trying to develop, and we're trying to win. And if we can do that, and we're trying to be exciting, and we're trying to create, example, game style. We're trying to play a certain way, we're trying to create more opportunities. If we create more opportunities than the opposition create, the likelihood is we're gonna win more games of football. That'll be dependent on the quality of players you have. So if you've got better quality players, and you're creating more chances, you have more chances of winning the game. Teams get one chance, they can't score on us. All right, we have to switch on. So it's a mentality thing. It's a mental thing. How do you, how do you train the brain? How do you try and mentally train? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> when you're traveling, that's fine. When you're not, you know, how do you mentally train the brain? How do you try and make sure that for 85 minutes you're not involved in a game because it's easy and you're in total control and then the five minutes when you think everything's fine, you switch off and you concede. And the, that's what I like, I enjoy, I embrace. You know, I do my work Monday to Friday. I say this, the boys get to play on Saturday. It's all down to them. That's why I'm very calm on the sideline. You know, you don't see me ranting and raving unless I need to, because it's not about me, it's about them. You know, and, and that's our big focus this year, to try and put a product on the field where it's exciting, it's where it shows what we're all about, but it's also a winning product as well. Um, I know speaking to you, which, um, just briefly, and speaking to people that know you, you've coached around the world, uh, are we doing enough? We always speak about the multiculturalism and diversity in this country. Yeah. Are we doing enough to bring that forward? I know this club is doing a lot with you know the African Nations Cup here, yeah. but do you think from an outsider coming in, the country is doing enough in terms of football of bringing players through? We're trying, yeah, but we're not doing enough. You know. Kids, boys, young, young boys, young girls from wherever, you know, a saying that stuck with me 
off from my early age coming from Wales was it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you're from, you should be given the chance and opportunity to play. All right, just because, you know, people talk about paid football. You know, in England, there's a, there's a lot of it. In America, there's certainly a lot of it and you have to, to pay to play. Well, my argument to that is what about little Tommy who's from a single parent home that can't afford to play? Should he miss out? Should he not get, get the opportunity that someone from a more privileged family should? No, he shouldn't. All right, so it's about, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into it. I understand that. There's a lot of opinions. I'm not the one of the decision makers, all right, and all of these things. But what I will say is, the more people, there's so many people worldwide that play the game. You know, we need to try and create opportunities for them to play. We need to actually find the best players. Um, the best players, whether you're from Wales, whether you're from Australia, whether you're from any part of the world, should be given the same opportunities to play. But After your first season and now coming in, realising what this club is, what can we expect from not only yourself and the team, the team this season? Well, you can expect a demand, a desire to win. You know, that was there last year. But now there is, you know, so I wouldn't say excuses. There were reasons which I knew, which I've addressed. Now there is no re excuses, you know. I've got to set my team up correctly to try and win a game. But now I know, I now know I've got good people with good values that understand what it's about. Because, you know, me coming into the football club a year ago, me coming into the country 18 months ago, you know, I had to get used to the football culture, the football landscape here. And I got kept getting told that... Sometimes people look at the negative rather than the positive. They look at what people can't do about what, what, rather than what they can do. You know, and I've never been that way. I've always been the person of what can they do, what can they bring, and try and then implement that within how we want to play rather than, well, he can't do that. Because if you look at it that way, players don't get opportunities. Um, so what, do, what, will you, can it, what can you expect? Will you expect? What will I expect? is a certain way of playing, a certain demand, a certain desire, a cer certain fundamentals which become non-negotiable of you as a person, of the players as people, as individuals and collective. But the one goal doesn't change. We're here to win. And uh, if we don't win, we might not be having this conversation next year, which, listen, is okay. Perfect, it was a pleasure. Right. Thank you very much. I look forward to this season coming to watch you guys. I look forward to seeing what trainers you have on the pitch, but all the best with the season. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.